<laughs> Welcome to my podcast, Shaping Your Journey. My name is Aldo Metza, percussionist, drummer, and artistic director of Cosa Music, inviting you to join us in conversation with friends, artists, professionals, and experts in the music world. Today, I have the great pleasure of having the phenomenal vibraphone player and, and of course, many other things, producer and uh, great musician, Mike Manieri. Thank you so much, Mike, for for joining me on this. This is, uh, I've been waiting a long time to, to have this conversation with you about shaping your journey. Of course, you've been, um, I've been watching you in, in concerts and, and clinics and, and actually you came to COSA, but um, talk a little bit before we get into the, the, the journey itself, talk a little bit like what that first seed was, what launched it for you. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you for that very nice introduction. Um, and I'll, I'll try to make this short because it's, it's a long, it's a very long career. And uh, I was born on the kitchen table on July 4th, 1938. And while my mother was giving birth, there was a party going on, it was, you know, large families in three rooms. And my uncles were like, you know, they love jazz. And they were playing uh, Hot Club of France, Benny Goodman, you know, inside while she was giving birth. So I heard, I was listening to jazz. The first it was the first sound that I heard be, besides my mother and father's voice. And so that continued, you know, through those years. In the, I was born in the Bronx, and uh, what we have is really basically the radio, you know. Or my father would take me to a Broadway show where I hear some of the big bands. And my step-grandfather was a pretty good jazz guitarist. And between his love for jazz and the entire family's love for, you know, big band jazz, and uh, my mother's inspiration when she first heard Marjorie Himes, who was a vibraphonist with George Shearing, who had a radio show out of Chicago, <clears throat> pardon me, and she loved the sound of the vibes. <clears throat> Long story short, when I was about 10 years old, she had worked in a sweatshop for a couple of years, bought me a small set of Deegan's, a two and a half octave vibraphone with cardboard resonators, <clears throat> wow. which was made during the war because they couldn't afford metal. <laughs> if they were trying to save metal. And that was my first instrument. I was about, I would say, 10 or 11. And she found me a teacher down on the Bowery. We had to take three trains to go down there and for me to take lessons from this guy. It was a terrible alcoholic, but a wonderful vibraphonist once she, once she sobered him up. And I studied with him until I was about 15. And uh, I made my first professional appearance on television show with my trio, Two Kings and the Queen. The guitarist was a woman, young girl. She was 16. The bassist was 16. I was 14. And we played the Paul Whiteman show, Kids and Company, the Mickey Mouse Club. I mean, there was all these children's shows. And we would play in these jazz arrangements. Uh, and I joined the union at 14. Wow. We had to. So I, you know, just played gigs, uh, you know, through my teenage years. And then I started taking everything, you know, pretty seriously with, with the idea that I was, get, you know, eventually going to go to Juilliard. And so then I started taking drum lessons from Doug Allen, Ted Reed, uh, I don't know if you know these names, J hey. J you know, Doc Freezy on uh, timpani, who was Saul Goodman's teacher. And, you know, I was serious about entering um, Juilliard, which I did. I, I wanted to there for about a two, three month period until I got an audition. Uh, I wound up getting an audition with Buddy Rich. And then I I was gone. I was on the road with Buddy Rich's quartet. I actually it was a when first started was an octet. And I can tell you how it happened, but I don't think it's it's really, really uh, important that that we know. How did that? How did that happen? Like, how did you get the Buddy Rich? Did he have, was he based in New York at the time? No, he, he no, he wasn't. Although he had an apartment in New York, but he really basically lived in 
had a house in Miami and one in Las Vegas. But I can tell you how that happened. Uh, I would always use older musicians uh, as a as a vibraphonist. One of the things my teacher said, if you want to do a lot of gigs, be a leader, because nobody is going to hire them. Vibraphonist, that's the last guy they can hire at a wedding or a bar mitzvah, you know, or a dance. <clears throat> so I always hired, even when I was 15, 16, I was hiring guys that were in their 20s and actually in their 30s. And there was this drummer by the name of Pete Volo, who's a very good friend of Buddy's. I think he followed him either on the Dorsey Band for a little while or the Harry James Band. And they became fast friends. He lived in the Bronx, and I used to use him on gigs. And he kept raving to Buddy about me. And he said, I don't need a vibes player. I had one vibes player that happened to be Terry Gibbs. He says, you know, we, we, we loved each other, but we fought like hell, you know. <laughs> Plus, I don't want to schlep that instrument all the way, you know, around the country. And so after... Pete's just sort of constantly bring up my name and so give him a chance, just let him audition. And then he did, he, he wavered and gave in and he was doing a gig at the Village Gate. And I sat in on the third set and um, set up my vibes with my father on the stage. The place was packed and calls out the first tune, which was Cherokee. You know, that was the one that Charlie Parker was or would, would, that was the test. You passed the test at a really fast, you know. Of, of course. He couldn't think of anything faster, right? <laughs> anything faster. And then he said, you know, they played the hat and you go, okay, you got a kid. And I played about 30 courses. I don't know, you know. One thing I, you know, I could do was play fast. You know, I had I had chops. And uh, after my solo, the audience gave me a standing ovation. And so he went to the microphone and said, you know, I have no other choice but to hire this kid. And that was, <laughs> that was the beginning of my association with him on and off for about six years. And I wound up doing all the arrangements and traveling with him all around the world, state departments, Afghanistan, you know, all through Asia, India, we played for the Shah of Iran. It was, a, you know, it was a fantastic, like, tour besides our usual Birdland and then Peps in Philly. And in those days, you did three weeks or two weeks at Birdland, two weeks in Philly, and then you did two weeks in Washington. And then make your way around the country. <laughs> and then after six months, you just, you know, start all over again or go to Europe for a little while. So right. that was my, yeah, that was my, that's my buddy, Rich. I saw you, I saw you, I, I recently saw, Mike, um, a little clip of you, and I, had, I hadn't seen this one before. I think it was at the Playboy Club in 61 with Buddy yes. Rich. It was, a, it was a great video clip on this one. Somebody mentioned that to me. I should look at it. I'm, I'm a little... Well, I probably look like I'm like 16 years old or something. I was yes. <laughs> pretty young. Uh, but I remember I was really sick on that show because oh. we were ready to go to on the State Department tour. As I talked about, our first stop was in Kabul, Afghanistan. And they gave us all these shots, you know, from yellow fever and whatever, malaria. Uh, and we were leaving from Chicago to go to New York and then fly over. And I had like 103 fever on that show. I was like, I was passed out after the show, but had a, had a great time, you know, being in Chicago. There was only one Playboy Playboy Club, where, which you know where everyone headed after <laughs> after the show. Back in the it, day, it was uh, the even with the fever. <laughs> nice, <laughs> and I mean you. Um, in the 60s, I remember you, we had a, this conversation that you were involved a lot in um, arranging for the rock bands and, and all the big sessions that used to happen uh, back in the 60s with the rock using uh, classical music or orchestra or horns and arrangements. So you've done a lot of those arrangements, right? Well, that, that happened after I left Buddy, and I think it was 64, and his... 
um, what, can, what can I call him? His, his drum tech was a good friend of mine, David, David Lucas, who uh, was a cousin of Don Elliott, who was a vibraphonist and had his own recording studio, was doing jingles. And um, so David and I <clears throat> would play on some and also, you know, make some, you know, do the arrangements of the rock. Don, Don was a jazzer, and uh, David and I went to the Beatles by then. So he, he, some commercials would come in with required a rock band, so we'd hire some rock musicians from the village who I was playing with at the time. I was playing with Jeremy Steig and the Satyrs and all these long, these hippies with long hair. and and. Uh, and we wound up doing like, you know, Brill Cream, a little damn will do you, but with a rock beat, you know. So <laughs> I started doing a lot of session work. And I I had married, and I by then I had one child. And I decided not to be on the road for a while. And I, you know, the sessions just started pouring in, which included, you know, playing on like an Aerosmith or Don McLean's uh, American Pie. And I, I don't want to go through all the names, but, you know, a lot of big stars. And, uh, you know, Paul Simon's several albums and Dire Straits. And, you know, did like a symphony orchestra arrangement for Aerosmith on one of their, probably one of their biggest albums. I've got all the gold records, it's like in the hallway hanging up. Not that I get any money for them, but <laughs> I was paid then. So I was doing, you know, I was taking lessons from Don Sebesky, a great ar arranger. Oh, wow. um, yes. I wanted to expand my knowledge of how to write for brass and, and, and of course, strings, which was, which was a little more da daunting. But uh, little by little, you know, I had the opportunity as these uh, gigs would come in. I started a jingle company with a friend of mine. And it was so busy in those days, although, I mean, you could do, if you were like an A player, like, you know, I, David Spinoza, or I don't know, you know who he is, guitar player, or say a Steve Gadd or Bernard Purdy, you could do 30, 40 dates a week. I mean, you could just be busy, like from nine o'clock in the morning, you do a two hour session on a jingle, you know, for commercial, TV commercial. And then from 12 to 4, there's a film day, and then another jingle. And then at night, you'd be at maybe Rudy Van Gelder's studio playing on a jazz, <laughs> on a jazz album, West Montgomery. And it would just, like, it snowballed, you know? Yes. You get two, three calls for, like, you know, for a 9 to 11 uh, time period. You just had to pick one. So I was really fortunate in the 60s and 70s and 80s when it started to wane because of, you know, all the electronic instruments came into play. The synthesizers really put, replaced, uh, you know, a lot of musicians. So I was really very lucky. I, I, I of course, we always played live. You know, I, I had various quartets. I was recording, put together a big band called White Elephant in the late 60s. But Randy Brecker, Michael Brecker, Ronnie Cuba, who unfortunately just passed away, and and my dear friend Michael Brecker also. Um, Steve Gadd was in the band. Um, Barry Rogers, Lou Soloff, John Faddis. It was all these amazing uh, musicians who would come in just to jam at night, like after all the sessions were over. I had access to all of those studios when they went dark because I was a producer. And a ranger. <laughs> and uh, we just get together. Sometimes five people would show up, sometimes like 25 musicians would show up. And we just blow, man, like on a groove. And then I started writing arrangements. And out of that milieu, that period from like 68 to 72, all the musicians that were in that band wound up in other bands like Dreams like Ars Nova, like uh, uh, Limage, which was a quartet that I had with Steve Gadd, Tony Levin, and myself, David Spinoza, and Tony Levin. Did I mention his name already? Yes. And then, and then steps ahead, 
uh, came out of that, which was in the middle 70s, late 70s. Yeah. Which I'm still, you know, touring with that band. Uh, not those musicians, but, the, you know, playing the music of Steph's head. So. And then. And you, I mean, the Brecker Brothers, during that time, I remember, because I used to go to New York a lot, because I used to, when I was studying at the university, I would go to New York once a month and study with various people there, because my whole idea originally was to move to New York and go to the, the studio route. That was my, so I used to hang out with, with Steve Gadd, actually, and he would take me mm -hmm. studios, and Lou Marini would take me to studios. Uh, Alan Schwartzberg would take me to various sessions, so I was learning the ropes and intro being introduced to people. So I saw that. And I remember when the Breckers, there was a bunch of people who had that, that club called Possible 20. You remember that? Yeah, there was that one. And then it was Brecker Brothers Club, which was called 7th Avenue South. That's right, 7th Avenue South, yes. Right. It was like the bar downstairs, and upstairs you would play. And that's where Steps Ahead, where I put that together. It was just sort of... Part, coming out of that white elephant thing from a decade before. Right. So it was the original band was Don Grolnick, Steve Gadd, Michael Brecker, Eddie Gomez, and myself. And so, uh, and I played with other, you know, um, bands there, like, you know, Bob Mincer and my electric band. I had an acoustic band that would. <laughs> And then I had an electric band with uh, Warren Bernhardt. Wow, that's Marcus right. Mill yeah, Marcus Miller. And uh, uh, what's his name? Oh, Keen. What's his last name? I can't think of his first name. I should know. It was Rachel Z's husband, Omar Hakim. Omar Hakim, right. Yeah, the whole Omar and uh, Bob Mincer and myself. Which was our electric band. It was electric bass, you know. Is that the time when you when you started messing around with electronics on the vibes? Because you were one of the first to to do that. That's true. I I was playing with Jeremy Stock and the Saders in the early sixties or middle sixties. Was after Buddy Rich, and it was a, basically a jazz rock band. Everybody was electrified, you know, electric guitar, clavinets, and then Jeremy Stein was a, fl a flautist. And he was hooked up to, like, amplifiers. And I was playing acoustic vibes. I'll never forget, I was sitting, we were playing at, the, at one of the clubs in the village, and in the back was uh, Richie Havens, the singer. I don't know if you remember him. Yes, yes, yes. I played at Woodstock. And I knew Richie, and I went back, and I said, that is the sound. He said, I can hear everybody but you. I couldn't hear a note you played. He said, you ought to hook up one of these little hot dots that I put on my, my guitar, my acoustic guitar, and I plug it into an amp. So you just need somebody to build a little preamp. So I did that. I just glued all the hot dots. I bought, you know, 47 of them, whatever it is. And a uh, fellow made a rail for me, you know, to plug them in. And then I started, you know, putting that into like wah wah pedals and different like fuzz, you know. And then I went electric. And that was probably uh, about 60, 67, 68. I used it on an album called Journey Through Electric Tube. And I, then I started adding, you know, synthesizers. Once I could MIDI everything up. Mm -hmm. At first, it was just you know monophonic sounds like with a, with a mini move or something like that, an instrument like that on the arm. And then once we you know went polyphonic, and then I was you know play Oberheim's and you know play chords basically. Yeah. So that was really fun, and I I've been doing. I still have. I don't know if you can see the microphone. It still has a pickup system. This is made by Malatech. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they basically, they basically, kind of took took the lead from K and K, who still, <clears throat> who was a fellow by the name of um, 
Dieter Kandel out, in, out on the West Coast, originally from Germany. He made the first, you know, uh, pickup system that was available to all the Vi players. And we had a wonderful relationship. So I still have, still use K and K. Those Vi farmers that are out there. I was going to say there was uh, Ray Ayat who who uh, came up with a system also it was similar to the K and K, the Ayat pickup system that he he built for us. Repercussion, we we used to we did the same thing. I mean, we we watched you and we said, oh, and this is this is where the the way we should go. And then we the the vibes would become a bass, and then we got you know we would go from electric to the acoustic, from a classical to the other end, and we just blurred the lines completely. But he had developed also that system um, much later, probably, I, I, I'm assuming, right? Uh, yes. Uh, it might have been a decade, decade later or so. Yeah, I, th I think it was in the 80s, if I remember correctly. Yeah, I was using it in 68. Well, it's on that album, which I think came out in 68. And then... Uh, Journey Through Electric 2, Mike Manieri. <laughs> I used it on there. Uh, as a matter of fact, I had no overhead mics, which I'm sorry I didn't do that. I was just playing through an amplifier. And they didn't record it very well. You know, they didn't really didn't know how to, you know, manage this new sort of uh, process. Right. But, uh, yeah, that might have been, might have been a decade later. Yep. Yeah, I think so. But you went you went really deep in in the whole MIDI MIDI vibes and all the synthesizers attached to your. I remember seeing uh, seeing you play. I think it was at the Montreal Jazz Festival, if I'm not mistaken, with with this setup, humongous. Of it was it was huge. Yeah, in those days, you you know you could <laughs> you could travel, uh, you could fly. You know, having these huge cases and put all your and synthes synthesizers, keyboard, the actual keyboard. We just didn't, you know. Um, yes. <laughs> uh, I remember. Rack, well. Right now, you have the racks. You know, they're much smaller and they're they're portable. But then I'd bring the entire keyboard because I was playing the keyboard um, also, and there was no overweight. Charges, which you know a lot about that, right? Oh yes, yes, yes. That you know that was a real bonus during the seventies. So you could you could travel all over the world, even beginning of the eighties. Then they started tightening that down because people were bringing amplifiers and speakers, and it was it really got pretty crazy. Yes, now I remember with repercussion, we used to travel with thirty nine. I remember thirty nine cases. And that was, you know, with the mallets, like marimbas, vibes, drums, like everything. We used to carry absolutely everything all over the world. We did two yeah. Asian tours that way. And, of course, I mean, that came to an end. It was impossible. Now you, one case, one suitcase is, is too much. But then they, they, it was great, yeah. So you, we were, I mean, you were able to do that. But you went on to, uh, after you went on to... Um, to establish a record label also, NYC Records. Am I am I right in that? Yeah, NYC Records. Yeah, I, I uh, in 80, during the 80s, I built a recording studio with a partner of, of mine, John Golden. And it took us like three years to build a studio. It was quite an undertaking. Uh, where we, you know, we wanted to have a, we had a production company where we would actually or recording uh, jazz groups uh, at night, and even hip hop groups like in the early eighties. And during the day, we were doing TV TV commercials. We had two rooms, wow. and we really got into this in Clavier, all of the latest technology at the time. And so, out of that production company, when that when we went out of business, I mean, it really got kind of slow on the CD. You know, the manufacturing of CDs uh, in the early 90s just it waned terrifically. The stores were closing, right? HMD, Virgin, they're all, they're all gone. Um, so we, we closed the studios, and I left with a 
cassette of a new Steps album. And I said, you know, I can go to maybe GRP or one of the labels or Blue Note and see if I, you know, they'd want to put this out. But I wonder what it's like if I just, if I just do it myself through in the independent labels. And I went out to the West Coast to this uh, conference where they had all the independent record companies would meet once a year. And then they'd meet in Cannes at the, you know, in, in France, uh, or, you know, once a year. Right. And also in Japan. So when I went out to California, I had, I had this little name tag, Mike Mieri, on me, and a cassette of uh, a Steps uh, album, which was called, it was called NYC. And I'm running into people who are like, independent like uh producers at small labels you know they were uh promoters people had stores and you know it's like maybe five six hundred people there and they would walk by and kind of do a double take are you mike near the vibes player you know oh i've got all you know records i left steps ahead i'm like what are you doing here <laughs> well i have this i'm you know i'd like to put this Put this out, put this album out. And uh, so I ran into, I was introduced to a woman by the, the name of Vera Brandis who had a label in Europe, in Germany. And she said, you know what, I'll do a deal with you. I'll license your record. And, but I want you to do 10 projects for me. And I was like, okay, this, is, this sounds good. She says, I'll introduce you to <laughs> I'll introduce you to a Japanese partner of mine. His name is Hasao Ebony, who's video arts music. And, and we did the same deal. So I had a release not only in Europe, a release in Japan that was covering, you know, pretty much all over the world. And then I I found a very good distributor here, you know, you know independent distributor here in the uh, United States. And th in those days, uh, everything was gotten from either from the big labels or from one stops. They would call them right. one stops. They were big warehouses where you, not like a big label, you'd order like, like 10,000 Whitney Houston's, you know, for the week. But if you wanted like threes and fours or eights or twenties, you'd go to a one stop. You know, even, even the majors, Labels did that. So I made a deal with this independent label, which was called Indie at the time. And they were the largest independent uh, distributor. Am I going on and on about this? But Oh, no, no. This is great. This is what I learned about marketing and, and uh, promotion. I hired a marketing person. And, you know, everybody was very helpful to me because they knew me as a musician and, you know, had listen to the work that I had done and all the musicians I play with. So I started the label. I said, you got to start a label. Of course, you got to call it something. <laughs> uh, and the name of the first album was NYC. So I just said, oh, we'll call it NYC Records. And then so I wound up with the 10 projects having to produce 10 albums, <clears throat> which I did. Nice. And started a label. I hired some employees, you know, to, to handle mar you know, marketing. I had like three or four people working at my office. And uh, I put out all of my wife's work, uh, Dee Carsonson, who's a harpist and folk singer. And she was also a jingle singer. And we put out about 10 of her albums. So, but nice. you know, it, it was fun while well, it lasted. I mean, I still have the label, but I don't really put much out these days. Right. I remember I, you just reminded me. I I remember you did a Beatles album, of of something. Am, am I correct in that? I, I'm just you're just jogging my memory. You you are wow. You've got an amazing memory. You know, because very few people knew about that, and very few few people still don't know about that album. I put out uh, guitar players playing their favorite Beatles songs. Okay. Uh, Towner. Uh, well, I wish I had it in front of me because of all the names. Um, there was um, Larry Coriel, uh, Hedges. I mean, there was just like, all the top guitar players. 
and they would just send me, you know, they'd send me their version. And I put it out and I was expecting it to sell like crazy. So we we, we printed like about 20,000 of them. <laughs> and uh, to my dismay, I discovered that I couldn't put it in the Beetle category, you know, in the, in the, what can I say, slots where all the Beatles music is, is uh, the Beatles albums. I had to put it in various, I don't, I don't know if you remember going to a store, then there were like various <laughs> albums. So we wound up in various, and in there is every kind of, you know, genre you can imagine. So the album really got lost. And I made a second Beatles uh, album, Beatles, that was uh, volume two of all guitar players. So it's a really, a, it's a collector's item. Although I still have probably about 15,000 copies sitting out in California. <laughs> Well, I, I should get one of those from you because I, I mean, I'm, I'm a Beatle fanatic, of course, but like many of us, but I am I'm, I was really surprised when I saw that. Not surprised, but happily um, surprised that all these jazz players, I mean, everybody uh, understood the value of, of the Beatles and what, what they were doing was this, like, this, this is classical music in the, in the new world, right? It's just another brilliant recording, brilliant producing, brilliant writing. I love them. I couldn't wait for the next album. And I, you know what amazed me was like, I'm, I'm thinking, all these jazz guys really not going to, I wonder how many, are gonna, man, they jumped in like head first. Every, uh, Adrian Blue, I mean, I couldn't believe the guy, Steve Kahn, oh man, you've got to let me do like this, you know, tune moving, you know, uh, actually I'll do the two tunes, you know, to Steelman, <laughs> I had everybody on these records. I couldn't believe I was I was like fighting them off. So I put Alan Holdsworth played on it. Wow. Yeah, I mean, just amazing cats. Um, so it was a joy. I mean, even though it wasn't a su successful album, if I could have put it in the they call it a bin. Yes. If I could have put it in that bin, I think we would have sold a lot yeah. more out. I mean, and that was the whole thing. It was like a grocery store. It, people were fighting for the 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 best place, and I remember once uh, hearing uh, well, Gino Vanelli mentioned that at some point his his music was put in um, uh, what, European, not European, but Italian music or something like that, you know, mm. and you know, I'm not surprised. <laughs> you know, you had <laughs> when you don't know, then people had to make decisions and and the marketing. Sometimes uh, some of the companies would say, "Well, we're paying you for this spot," like you know, like they do in grocery stores, right? So you had to fight that too as as well. But um, it, it's a, it's amazing. Also, the uh, I mean, during the whole process, that you managed to uh, just spearhead, like like you said earlier. Uh, to be working, you have to be uh, the employer, not just wait around for the phone to ring. So you just did it. I mean, you were in New York, which was a place where a lot was happening, of course. But also, you didn't just sit and wait for people to call you. You just went out and did it, no matter what. <laughs> I did. I mean, it, it, that lesson learned from my original vibraphone uh, teacher was... Okay, be a band leader, and you know, and and open your ears to everything. And then when I started, you know, writing arrangements, it just, you know, my career blossomed. You know, if I had stayed on the road as a just a jazz vibraphonist, you know, like many of the great vibraphonists like Burton and Milt and Bobby Hutchison, and on and on and on, they're still doing that. Doing it. Um, it and you know, they weren't drawn to the music I was drawn to in the 60s, where I really got into folk music. I was playing with Tim Harden. I was living in Woodstock. I moved my entire family to Woodstock. So I was up there with Dylan and, you know, John Sebastian and, uh, you know, all of these folk musicians. Wow. And, of course, Mingus lived up there. So, you know, Sonny Rollins lived. So there was Jack DeJanet and uh, Matheny. Uh, I can go on and on. So it was an amazing sort of collection of, of, you know, musicians that live in this one town. This is before the festival. 
and after the festival too. So uh, my ears were like open to all of this music, and I really, I really enjoyed playing with with singer songwriters. I, I, I could, you know, I learned to play, not to play bebop, <laughs> Paul Simon or James Taylor. You know, okay, play a solo, and uh, so you just have to sort of, you know. Play like a guitar player would play, like a rock, not a, or like a folk guitar player, or, or uh, just more, much more lyrical, but make it interesting, and you know, not stale and and, and simplistic. And so, I, you know, I was one of the guys that was getting the first call when McLean was going to do another album or. James Taylor's brother, Livingston Taylor, Carly Simon. I produced three of her albums and played on her albums. You know, I can go on and on. And I just did, did something with McCartney about six years ago, but it was a jazz album. It was okay. Really like I was expecting it was going to be one of his, you know, pop albums. And I got a call from the, the late punk Tommy Lapuma. I don't know if you know him. Yes. Tommy, you know, who unfortunately passed away. We were very, very good friends. He he hired me on so many sessions. And uh, he said, yeah, I'm working with Paul McCartney, and I need to overdub Diana Krall's trio. Diana's doing all the arrangements for Paul, and he's singing these songs from the 1920s and 30s that his father used to play on the piano when he was a kid. I went, oh, man. I, I knew everyone. My mother used to sing those songs, you know. <laughs> Wow. Me and my shadow, I'm going to sit right down and write, just, you know, write myself a letter, you know, like kind of like a little corny, but really nice arrangements that she did. He said, well, we already did the album in L.A., already recorded the album, but but Diana plays these nice little sort of shearing, you know, George Shearing licks, and I want you to double them. And I had, there was no music. So, you know, I transcribed it. And then Bucky Pizzarelli, the guitar player, and John Pizzarelli. So we did that vibraphone, piano, guitar sound that Shearing was so well known for back in the day. And, you know, I did maybe five tunes or six tunes. And I had didn't hear from Tommy. And like about three months, he said, hey, we're going to do a live BBC concert out in L.A. And also, uh, we're going to stream on iTunes at Capitol Studios, which was like, you know, capital is capital. You know, Frank Sinatra did all his records that I can't call. And I had done quite a few dates there over the years. And they flew me out there, and the whole week we worked with Paul and a lot of guests uh, on that album, where I was expecting to play more you know, inside, as they say. And this was like a sort of a jazzy version of Paul McCartney singing these songs. It it was a tribute to his dad. So you never knew. It was really, for me, I thought it was interesting. You never knew what what the call was going to be. Right, right. You know, you had your guides, you know, you had your stuff, all your stuff in a a cartridge like... uh, um, locker, and uh, they would bring it to the session, and you'd show up and you'd play tambourine. You know, when they were playing triangle with some, you know, timpani, and you know, for a film score. And so it was, it was an incredible uh, time. And you know how, how busy it was in those days. Yeah, yeah, I oh, know for sure. I mean, I, yeah. And I mean, doing a, a TV show, a regular TV show, and then running around with, with my own group, Repercussion, and then playing with anybody, everybody who's like, I was three people because some people knew me only as a, knew me as a drum set player, others as a classical percussionist, and others as a, the show percussionist who did all the pop popular stuff. And, and you, you know, and, and some, um, uh, some of the contractors actually didn't know that you did the other because it's impossible that you know that one person could be doing all of that. But I had, you know, my gear show up at sessions, and uh, you know, and sometimes I made even made mistakes. Uh, I would be called, and then I'd call back, and I'd say, "What? What's that? What am I playing?" 
<laughs> me too, I would do the same thing. Or I would just show up with the, you know, and the, of course there would be always be a vibraphone in the studios in those days. Yes. So, and a marimba. So I didn't have to worry about that. I'd bring my mouths and then my trap case, you know, that had bongos. And if they needed kungas, I said, well, you know, they would tell me, oh, we need kungas. And then I, they would, SIR, or one of those yeah. rental companies would bring some kungas. You know, and I learned to play all these instruments besides, you know, the drum set and uh, yeah. the things that I knew well. I could never play a percussion like you do, you know, as well as you. But enough, you know, to get through like a session where you're playing maybe four or five instruments and you're reading, you know, yes. a little triangle here, a giant note there, a roll on the timpani. <laughs> You, know? you just you just reminded me of a of a one of the first big professional gigs I did. I was still at university, and my my teacher Pierre Belus was my my teacher at McGill University. He says, "What are you doing this summer?" I said, "Well, you know, usual. I'm playing the clubs and I'm playing this and that." It was I, I hadn't graduated yet. It was my second or third year, and I was getting getting calls. You know, it was just starting. So he says, "Here's a number. I can't do this gig." You do this. It's uh, two months um, starting in Vancouver. It was a Canadian tour of the original uh, cast of Fiddler on the Roof. And so, the, but they're hiring the musicians in Canada, but it's the whole, the whole show from there. At Five ish Finkel, I mean, all of these guys who are uh, on the show. And the conductor is Anton Coppola, who was Francis Ford's uncle who just passed away not too long ago, at, at 100 years old, I think. And so I showed, this is funny because I, I showed up and uh, there's the drum set over here and all the percussion that they had rented on the other side because there's two books. So, I, so, you know, knowing, you know, as a percussionist or even drum, a drummer, whatever, you show up early because if you don't show up early and set up, there's no room for you. <laughs> As you know, right? <laughs> so I always I learned I learned early that show up two hours before everybody, take the space you need, and you're ready when they come in because you had to figure out what went where and, and you know do your whole geography and layout. Yeah. So I said, okay, I'm not sure which book I'm playing, but it was my percussion teacher who recommended me for, for this, so it must be the percussion. So I opened the book and I set up the percussion because I had a lot of experience in the shows. I set it all up and it looked good. In walks uh, Anton Coppola, the conductor who looked, was a little Toscanini type. I mean, I'm sure you worked with him. And I, I said, oh, Mr. Mr. Coppola, I'm Aldo Mazza, uh, the percussionist. And I said, and I asked him, I said, who's uh, playing drums? He looked at me, he says, you are. <laughs> I said, oh, I said, oh, I thought I was doing the percussion. No, no, that's why we're having a couple of extra rehearsals because we have to put the two books together and you're playing both. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> you had some pretty good reading chops. <laughs> oh, I, and I, I suddenly said, oh, now I understand why they're paying me so much money. I said, oh, boy, okay. So I quickly you know, did the whole thing quickly before people would show up, of course, and it turned out to be a 360-degree uh, setup. And it, and it was funny because he would have to stop every few seconds, you know, every, every few bars or something. He would say, okay, Aldo, don't play the xylophone there. I need the drums on this. So, you know, so I would be mapping it out, and I had, you know, stands all over <laughs> and learn, the, learn the, the whole routine and the map. And it was like two days of rehearsals, and and one day I was in the uh, elevator, and I'm 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 sweating because I said, man I I can't do this this is going to be beginning and end of career, in one in one show, so the the accordion player his name was Sal he was he traveled with the show, and I said Sal I don't think I can do this. I'm going to call and ask somebody to, to come out because I, I can't do this. I can't just sink, you know, as I'm just getting into into the uh, the professional world, right? And he says, no, Aldo, you'll be fine. You're doing a great job. I, I mean, that's a lot of stuff. So Five-ish Finkel, you remember from Picket Fences and all those shows, uh, Ian, Ian's 
father, who was that great xylophone player, right? Amazing. Yeah. And so he said, oh, so you're Aldo. <laughs> and I said, oh, great. <laughs> So they used to make fun of me on stage during the show. They used to call out my name, you know, Aldo, <laughs> just out of the blue. And opening night, they, they just mentioned my name on stage and the whole orchestra just just started laughing. And I said, oh, no, like, you know, and I'm just, I was just young and getting into this. And I'm like the young guy and everybody's like all the, the, to the top guys in town. And I'm saying, oh, man, this this is I can hardly wait till this is over. But anyway, it worked out later. But I, I don't envy you. And that's I've been in a few of those situations, maybe not that chaotic, but you know, where you're, you know, these, you know, they had these music uh, sessions, you know, yeah. the elevated music. And when you got called, I only did one, I would never take another one. But there was no stopping. Like you would play, you would record for 45 minutes and then take a 15 minute break but they had somebody you know <clears throat> play one song right after another but seamlessly wow the music there would be somebody who just turning the music like this and you know it's your sight reading and it's just going by and going by and you have you know what you're going to play it's like okay there's a sound sound phone orchestra bells chimes you know there's different percussion, your tambourines, and, you, and it would be like, you know, playing all the schmaltzy, you know, stuff that you heard in the elevator, like the Mathamati type I stuff. remember it well. <laughs> and man, I sweat that day. I earned every penny because, you know, you're making so much more money if you play the singles and doubles and triples and quadruples, you know, yes. it was scale and it was double scale and then it was, you know, and yes. I said, but it's not worth. This is not worth it. I, I, that's it. Never mind. The music was, eh, you know, <laughs> I could, I could live without it. I was busy enough. But that that brings back that memory where there was, I felt like I needed roller skates, man. You know, to go from a, a marimba all the way over there and you just go in and hit a chime like a note on a on chimes or something. You know, you had to make it back. <laughs> yeah, you know, all these music stands with the same music, but you had guys just moving it like it was assembly line. Yeah, yeah, so. that's amazing. But it, I mean, it's it's nice to know that you you had to do that too to to earn a living. Or I mean, it was, it's is what we love to do. But being fortunate to do this stuff. But I mean, you've been such a creator, such a uh, 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 a point of reference for for a lot of us, especially in, in the Malo world. I mean, the things that you were doing was uh, for years. And and speaking of which, I, um, you helped develop some instruments uh, with double pedal. You want to talk about that and and the range? Oh yes, we were talk we were discussing that before we went on uh, online. Uh, <clears throat> this instrument behind me, I asked uh, I endorsed Yamaha vibraphones and uh you know they bought i played deegan but all those years with steps ahead uh for maybe 30 30 years or so and yamaha bought bought deegan they bought the deegan company so uh, when i was approached by yamaha i said you know what i will endorse your instrument if you make a three and a half octave so that'll go down to the low c Beautiful. and they were they were reluctant. They were going to like this is like it's going to cost us a lot of money for just you know for this one guy, <laughs> you know, because I think at the time David Friedman, uh, Dave Samuels. Uh, Samuels, you know, a lot of guys were playing must uh, Yamaha because they had uh, <clears throat> it was a large company and they were endorsing quite a few people, and they they made the instrument and it was just really beautiful. It has the single pedal, and uh, it sold so well. I said, "You know, you guys are, you got to make a four octave for the classical players," which they did. And you, you see them in a lot of symphony orchestras and a lot of percussion ensembles. But the instrument behind it was a Deegan that was made especially for me because I played Deegan from I I guess from '60 right through the '90 about '92. 
and Deegan made me all kinds of instruments. But this one in particular is a four octave. It's from C to C. And uh, with pickups on it, they put their own pickups on, on this instrument. Really well done. And what I did when I first got it, I was like, you know, I wonder what it would be like if I split the pedal, like where I had two dampers from like two, the first two octaves from C to C, and then the last two top, upper octaves, you know, so where this pedal that comes like this, right? And so if you step on here, the lower, I don't know if you can see my hands. No, okay. Yeah, oh, now you can. So, and you step on here, the lower octave, you could hit a chord, have it sustain, and with your, your right foot, your left foot does this. The right foot is just blowing lines, you're blowing lines without having to dampen, you know, or vice versa, hit a chord here on the upper two octaves, and then blow, you know, play a line down here without a really fast line, because, you know, you can't play fast lines when you have to dampen every note. Or you just, if you step in the middle, the whole thing is, is dampened. Beautiful. The entire instrument is dampened. What a great idea. And I just had it re, it was sitting in, a, in a, my son's garage for like 25 years. I just had it, had it redone about two months ago, three months ago. And this wonderful cat, Glenn, picked it up. This car brought it out to Indiana, refurbished it, and brought it back. And now I'm just experimenting with it. I'm learning to, you have to sit down and play it, basically. You have know, a stool so you can, right. you know, <laughs> work the what a, what a great idea. You know, I only recently, I because I, I, I had been asking the companies, because I, I play Musser, I had been asking them for years to go down to the low E, because some of the transcriptions we would do, um, you know, any guitar things, you'd have you'd want to go down to the E, but you couldn't, you know, so you had to make adjustments. And then recently I saw, only recently, that Claro Musser had actually uh, created uh, a vibe that went down to the low C way back before he sold the company. He, he did, yeah. And actually, uh, I don't know if you know this guy, Van der Plas in Holland. He made a... He made a, a a four octave vibraphone. As a matter of fact, he, he actually made me, he was such a big fan, he made me a set of his bars, three and a half octave bars, which I had downstairs. I was going to take them out and listen to them. They sound more like a musser. The Yamaha is bright, you know, and um, well, I guess I'm going to play on your, <laughs> uh, but you know, it's really nice playing. Should I play a little bit or? Yeah, let, let's let's see what it sounds like. Sure. Yeah. Is that loud enough? Yeah, that's great. Yeah, beautiful, beautiful. And then, as I was mentioning before we started recording, um, some of the people that I've had on as guests actually played on my theme. And I'll, I'll send you the track, and if you feel like playing on that theme, I'd be so honored. 
I'll send it to you and you can, you can decide. It'd be my pleasure. Sure. I, I have another quick, quick question for you. You have a, a special technique that you play where you're, you put your, your mallet hmm. in your pinky. I do. Like that? I mean, that's my first lesson. Uh, <clears throat> with this, <coughs> uh, gentleman that my mother found way down in the Bowery. His name was Len Leach, and it was an excellent vibraphone. He, I mean, he would have been famous, I think, quite famous, uh, but he was a terrible alcoholic. He could just never make a gig. <laughs> he never could show up on time. But anyway, he put, the, he put them in, sort of in my, probably you can see that, in my hands like that. Wow. And his idea was, okay, you can play, I don't know if you can see this or not, Yep. They like we seconds can. really easily. Yes. as if you were a pianist. Right. I'm like This is a more of a stagnant, right? It's a power grip, you know, the Burton grip. Uh, but you're not really, you have to kind of do that with your elbows. I don't know if you can see me, right, to play right. seconds, yeah. right? Or... Yeah. I mean, when I first saw you play that, I mean, I, I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't, really understand how you get so much more uh, so much sound from your from this part i mean i learned uh, first one person to teach me to hold four mallets was actually gary burton i was very fortunate so i learned the the burton grip right like that and i and you and you have power and then when i saw you play with with your pinky i said how does he get such a great sound and control with the with the pinky? I mean, you do, of course. Oh, I was younger then. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, now, now in the right hand, I'll, sometimes I'll use the Burton grip. Okay. Okay. You no, know, I'm 84, so my hands are getting a little bony. So, like the left Eight. hand, I'll, I'll, you know, because I'm, you know, I'll hit a note here and there and and make my way. But with the right hand, you're playing more of the melody, so I'll, I'll use the Burton grip uh, on the right hand, so, you know, depending on the song. So, yeah, uh, yeah age had something to do with that. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's interesting that, that you had developed and, and, and went on with this script. I mean, just to, just to say that there's no one way to, to play things and no way, one way to do things, um, you know. The, the lock has a very interesting grip, too. It, it's... Kind of like a Stevens grip, but not quite, you know. Yeah, it's another another great player, yeah. Yeah, amazing, you know, facility on the instrument, one of my favorite players. So many young, uh, great vibraphones. It's just amazing uh, what, what, what's going on. I wish there were, I wish it was the 70s and 80s for these young masters of the instrument. In 60, you know, the 50s, 60s, there was... Because there was so much work, you know, so many clubs, jazz clubs, and uh, right. and now with the pandemic, of course, not to <laughs> bring our conversation <laughs> down, or it's been it's been become yeah much more difficult financially. But I'm but I'm seeing yeah, I'm seeing you know more and more. Uh, I was at the PASIC uh, conference, and I I'm seeing the energy back at least, you know, and people are out there and and. Uh, People are creating new things, so I, I think uh, you know the idea that the, the world ended. It was you know it, it doesn't. It just it's just different, and you know just like when you were going in and you know you were before us and saw what was happening in the '40s and '50s, and then you were suddenly in the '60s and '70s. It was day and night, right? And then later on, 
it's it's something else. I mean, what we think, we just, we're a passage. I mean, we do what we do, and we're fortunate to have embarked on that train, right? That's the way I see it. And to be able to have done such great things, and, and you know, you certainly have. No, I mean, it'll, you know, the music will live, let's face it, because, as you say, the young musicians and people like yourself um, are, you know, creating that path, the, path, the new pathways uh, for music, you know, new ensembles, like, so, um, and, and which brings, you know, brings a, a younger audience, a new audience to all of this music. Yeah, percussion is just so, it's so, such a fascinating world of yeah. percussion. And and the moment you have creativity, I mean, there are always people starving for new things, and then they become, you know, you're a creative person. Then you you come up with new ideas. I mean, just like, and it doesn't have to be just in the music, in in the techniques, the instruments. And speaking of instruments, we spoke about my my invention, my development of this new stand for mallet instruments that will solve, I mean, it solved my problem of, you know, when, when you're playing mallets and somebody asks you, well, can you move that mallet instrument over? Then now the stand goes with you. You don't have to move the stand. Oh, I love that idea. And, and then you're mentioning something interesting that I mentioned to Manhasset, who's, who's uh, building this thing and, and marketing it. I said, one of the things I had not thought about was, when you mentioned to me when you were recording and as you're playing and you're pedaling, all of a sudden the bars start hitting your your music stand and you ruin a track or a good take, right? Absolutely. I mean, it happens to me here. <laughs> As a matter of fact, you know, uh, and it's so easy for the wheels, you know, the locks on the wheels are not sometimes great or if you get to put one on. And suddenly in the middle of a take and you hear, bzzz, you know, a little buzz. So. <laughs> you know, I mentioned that to the company. I said, well, we've, prob we've solved that problem, too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that was a great idea. I can't wait to, yeah. I can't wait to see it. Yeah. And, and you know, and, and it's great, like, when you have people who are coming up uh, these days and looking at some of the great masters and, and like yourself and Gary Burton, who's, who had done so much, um, and 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 if, you know it's an inspiration, a constant inspiration. And then the fact that you're, I mean, eighty four, you said, eighty four, yes, eighty four. Wow, that's incredible. And you're still playing. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yes, I'm still playing. No, seriously, seriously, because I was, uh, I'm working on a project now with a big band with um, Mark Egan is playing on it, and Peter Erskine. Of course, we're doing it. You know the. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> overdubs, but uh, you know, I've been in a lot of. I just did something with Ricky Lee Jones. I don't know if you remember her. Yes, of course. Yeah, Rick is uh, somebody's in love. That that great song Steve Gadd plays on it. Yes, one of my greatest. Ah, uh, that fill he does in the middle of that song. Oh my God! Oh, isn't it great? Chucky's in love. That was Chucky's in love. That's right. Uh, yeah, oh. she, I got a call from her. Uh, Producer Russ Teitelman, who I've done so many records with over the years, and he said, and, you know, uh, she has a vibraphonist, you know, that works with her, and she lives in New Orleans. Uh, I don't know his name, but uh, I think he uh, had played on this one tune. And, uh, and then Russ said, hey, would you, would you give this a shot? And I said, sure, you know, and they liked what I did, and and uh, so I'll, I'll be on a new album. And I just heard the album, just really, she's singing so, so great. You know, a lot of standards, which uh, that's in my, uh, in my repertoire of standards. <laughs> my right. wheelhouse, as they say now. But uh, I had a great yes. time doing it. And I did it at home. And it was kind of nice, you know, just like I'll be in my own space here. And uh, yeah, uh, I mean the, the new technology now is allow is allowing us to do this. And I don't. I think this is just the beginning, actually, of of things we could do. When I travel now, all my students follow me wherever I am, whether I'm in this environment or any other environment. You know, recently I was in Venice and Rome, 
and to my place in Calabria. And I was just teaching from wherever. I mean, you couldn't do that before and, and still uh, continue your momentum and you're playing and you're playing, teaching, uh, the collaborations. And also, I mean, now there's this, um, I'm not sure if I spoke to you about this. There's a company in Sweden that developed a, um, an interface where you could play live without delay. It's called Elk, E-L-K. And, and uh, you know, you just, you have to have that interface, but up to 3,000 miles or something, or 4,000 kilometers, I forget what those numbers were, absolutely no delay. And you can play live, people are, are using it. Um, you know, I, I'm, I, I spoke to the people about this and I've been watching their demos and so I'm gonna explore that one myself. It's, yeah, I'm trying to think of the vibraphonist who's like a really good friend of mine. You know, at 84, my mind, I, names just go. But he, he uh, is the musical director at Lehman College, where I've done a lot of uh, performances for the young kids. Because I'm a Bronx boy, and, you know, there are a lot of poor kids up there. So, At Lehman. Yeah. You mean Alan, Alan Molnar? Yes, Alan. So yes. Alan was telling me about this. Yeah. I don't know. I, I turned Alan on to this, of course, and then he went crazy with it. <laughs> went crazy, and we did something together, and then I did a live. You know, I've done a, I've done a few live benefit, benefit type concerts. One with the center fielder of my favorite ball team, which is uh, the New York Yankees. That would be Bernie Williams, guitarist. We did something together. This guy plays great. He's like blew me away. You know, right, sort of like Benson, kind of George Benson style. Excellent, excellent player. So I had him sign a ball. <laughs> <laughs> nice. You know, leave it to one of my my grand grandsons. But because uh, I've been collecting them since I was a kid. Wow. You know, I'll give you a quick story about baseball because I really love it. Uh, there a, was a community, community center. I don't know if you, you know the Arthur Avenue section of the Bronx. But it's an Italian section. Yes, yes. I, and I've eaten there. There's some great Italian restaurants there. Yeah. It's like like great Italian food. They're still doing it. Like, they're still continuing the tradition. And, but there was a community center. I was, you know, born right down there. And we would play concerts to raise money for the you know, build a playground or whatever. And I was 14, maybe I was 13 or 14, and I was playing with that little trio I was telling you about, and then Yogi Berra made an appearance, you know, <laughs> and I got a ball signed by him, and then Phil Rizzuto came, and DiMaggio, you know, like all of these Italian-American, you know, either they'd be singers or, or uh, athletes or boxers, you know. So, um, anyway, you brought that to mind that, that li you triggered that little new, uh, technological gadget triggered that, that, uh, conversation that I had with Alan, cause he was so excited about it. He says, Mike, we'll be able to play in sync. And I went, I can't wait because, you know, I have a Norwegian band that I've been touring with for 25 years. I have a Dutch band that I go over and I tour with the Dutch guys. And then the Italian band up at the northern part. And so we do like, you know, I'll do maybe two, three times a year with those bands. And then something with the WDR big band or various big bands in Europe. And then I'll go out with one step, steps ahead, you know, tour. Uh, and... So I'm missing a lot of that now. I'm a little concerned about travel yet. Oh, you know, sure, of course, of course. I haven't gone to Europe yet, so uh, in a while. But uh, I'm getting ready, though. <laughs> My wife is discouraging me, but <laughs> the door is closed, and so she can't hear me. For Well, she's going to listen to this, I'm sure, at one point. She said, Mike, I want to hear what you said. <laughs> But I mean, forever, forever young, Mike, and and you know that's such an inspiration. I mean, watching people like you, um, I, I guess the word is uh, still having that curiosity, right? Curiosity of, of of another opportunity to play this or another idea. I mean, it's it's incredible. 
Thank you. Yeah, and and watching people like you just not you know you could say well yeah been there done that and you know uh, can't be interested but it's really nice when people like yourself who have been doing it for so long and we've been following and watching all our all our our, our lives right and then seeing that you know seeing that distance you say well if that person can do it it's like Ringo Starr Paul McCartney Mick Jagger. That just makes us feel young. It feels like everything is possible. So it just, it, you can, right? And it, and and watching, and, and having, and watching this curiosity like like you have, it's fantastic. I, you know, I was, I'll bring this up. Not that I'm dropping names, but when I did the Paul McCartney sessions out at the Capitol, we rehearsed all day long. Now, McCartney's almost, you know, he's up there. In the upper he's eighty. Center. He's eighty. Zadie. And so we would rehearse all day. And at night, he would go and rehearse for the Grammys. This guy had an amazing stamina. stamina. And we did that all week. And plus, during the day, like, they take him outside and he put his hands in concrete and they were doing all kinds of awards for him. And, you know, on that weekend, we did play one of the songs from, the, from that new album. And I was going, like, how does this guy do it? I know, I'm pretty sure he's a vegetarian. He has cook there, I think, and a doctor, and his wife was there. But but he was strong, man. He was in great shape and so curious. That's the thing. He was so curious. He was really humble, you know, through this whole thing. Because we were a little bit out of his milieu, you know, his genre of jazz songs, you know, and all these jazz musicians were there with a full orchestra with strings and everything. Wow. And, but I, he blew me away, man. You know, I was like, okay, let's rehearse some more. Let's rehearse some more. And I, was, I said to Tommy, who was with the poem, I said, man, is he going to have any voice left at the end of the week? As a matter of fact, he, he lost his whistle at the, the last, he was supposed to whistle the last chorus on the last tune. And he was going like, he went, I lost my whistle, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it was so funny and he cracked up laughing you know so i guess i'll have to hum it you know but i was gonna like what a remarkable guy you know to be able then he was going on tour you know right. playing the huge stadiums and stuff like that so yeah if you're healthy and and you have that and the fire is still in the belly as they say then you know do it yep do it. Uh, absolutely. No, no. And, and, and you're, you're in that league, uh, Mike, you, you talk like them, but you're part of them, <laughs> you know, for us, for sure. And, and I want to thank you for, for joining me in this conversation. We can go on forever, but I said, it's going to be a long conversation. This is going to be a long conversation <laughs> and I want to thank you, but you know, um, I'm sure we'll cross paths and it, you, it's been wonderful having this conversation and sharing it with other people who, you know, would, would be interested for sure to, to listen to this. Well, thanks for the opportunity. I'm, I'm, I'm honored to uh, always have a conversation with you or perform with you. It's been, you know, a long ride. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mike. And as I always say, to be continued. Yes, to be continued. Till then.